tonight. So it is uh, my pleasure to present uh, historian, author, commentator, blogger, activist, and maybe the greatest compliment I can pay, leader. Uh, please welcome Mr. Trevor Loudon. Thanks so much, guys. What a great turnout. It's excellent. Can everybody hear me okay? Down the back? Everybody hear me up there? Can you understand a real southern accent? Okay. Southern as you can get without being a penguin. Okay. Look, thanks for having me here tonight. Thanks, John. Thanks for organising this. And I want to say thanks to a whole bunch of people I know in the crowd. There's a lot of familiar faces here. And thanks to Ron and Denise for hosting me and feeding me already. So I'm, I'm feeling sated and happy and good. So I'm going to really let rip tonight, okay? <laughs> and um, so I'll give you both barrels because this is my first, my first engagement in Michigan on this tour. I'm doing about 12 events, I think it is. And I love coming to the state. I use your state as an example all over. I say thanks to people like you, you know, Michigan is a right-to-work state now. And people go, yeah, how could Michigan be a right-to-work state? You know, so you've done a heck of a lot here, and you're very well organised. It's a real credit. Now, what I do is I travel the country on, basically on 90-day visas. I've done for probably 300 engagements to Tea Party conservative groups all over the country. And as I say, they give me 90 days but I'm going to do 91 sometime because apparently I get a free cell phone. <laughs> and I'm hanging out for it. What a great country. So, um, look, everybody always asks me, why, why do I care about America? And I say there are two reasons. Well, there are many, but the two most important ones are this. The first is simple gratitude. My country was only saved in World War II from an invasion by the Japanese by the huge sacrifice of your fathers and uncles and grandfathers at the battles of Guadalcanal and the Coral Sea and Midway. You know, we were facing annihilation, folks, and you saved us. And that memory is very strong in my country today. The second reason is related, but it's a bit more selfish. You know, Ronald Reagan had it right. This is the last best hope for mankind. If freedom should fail in the United States, if you lose your constitution and your liberty and your economic dynamism and your military superiority, all of which are in grave danger, the bad guys of this planet are going to carve up the world amongst themselves. I'm talking Russia, China, Iran, Cuba, Nicaragua, Venezuela, North Korea and their Islamic allies. They will take this planet apart if you guys go down. You know, I get emails all the time from people saying to me, look, if things turn bad in America, can I come and live in New Zealand? And I say, look, you know, come down, you'll love the place, but it's not a refuge. Just 1,500 miles to the north of us lie the beautiful Fijian Islands. A wonderful place, but the Chinese are now training the Fijian military. They're building big hydro dams on the islands. They will have a port there for their blue water navy in the not too distant future. Tonga is pretty much the same. Most of the small Pacific microstates are coming under Chinese dominance now. And now they're moving into our country. Just um, two years ago, the Australian Minister of Defence, and if you're not sure about Australia, it's a little island off our west coast. Okay? Get that right? Okay. Now, he was up in China for talks, and a top Chinese general publicly embarrassed him. He said, America, he said Australia needs a godfather. The question is this, will it be an American godfather or a Chinese godfather? If you are smart, you will choose China because we are the growing power in the region. Now, he wouldn't have been cocky enough to say that under President Bush or Clinton, certainly not under Reagan. 
But he's arrogant enough to say that now because he sees the leadership coming out of your White House. And all around this planet, folks, your allies from Israel to Germany to Britain, Canada, um, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, Australia, they're all freaking out because they see that your president seems to love the bad guys more than he loves them. Well, exactly. You know, they saw what your president did to Poland and Czechoslovakia, took away their missile shield, protecting them from the Russians. They saw him abandon Georgia to the Russians after all the fighting they did to get away from their clutches. And they see what he's doing in the Ukraine right now. Your country has a binding treaty signed in your Senate to protect the Ukraine from Russian military aggression. They gave up their nuclear arsenal in exchange for that promise. And now that they need it, what is Obama doing? He's sending out John Kerry. Yeah. What's Kerry going to do? Threaten to cut off Russia's ketchup supplies. It's about the most he can do. The contempt the Russians have for this was shown in a big poster I saw, a placard and a demonstration in downtown Moscow. They were mocking America, and one of these placards said this, your pawn is harder than your sanctions. <laughs> Sums it up, doesn't it? So you have a president who cries peace all the time. He's got a Nobel Peace Prize in his trophy cabinet, yet he has abandoned Reagan's doctrine of peace through strength. And if you abandon your strength, folks, what's going to happen to your peace? And you've got Israel now with its back to the wall. They have no friends in the Middle East thanks to the meddling of your president. And they may be forced to take desperate measures to defend themselves. And those measures could put us into World War III. Japan was never supposed to rearm after World War II. And now they're rearming, which doesn't please us in Australia and New Zealand. But we understand that they cannot trust Obama to protect them from South, North Korea and China. And you see where this is going, folks. When your president called for support to go into Syria, how many of your allies lined up to help out? Fat zero. It might have been France, was it? You know? And I'm not saying they should have. It was madness. But that shows where American prestige and leadership is going. Your allies are backing off you, folks. And your enemies are getting bolder and bolder. Russia is trying to rebuild the old Soviet empire. The Ukraine is just the first step. China is building a huge blue water navy in the Pacific. They have control of most of Africa. The communists control most of Latin America. Europe is neutralised. North Korea and Iran are working together on EMP weapons. Six nuclear bombs fired into your atmosphere above your country would destroy your, nuclear, your whole electric grid across the country. Your own government has said that if that happens, and there's very little protection against it, 80% of Americans will be dead within a year. How serious can you get, folks? And the Congress is doing nothing to correct the situation. So this is pretty, you know, this isn't about losing some of your liberty, because you're Americans, you can take it back. This isn't about a depression. You've survived those before and you can survive them again. But have you ever been in a position where your commander in chief is cutting your military to ribbons when your enemies have not been stronger for years? When the world economy is teetering on the brink of collapse, Obama wants to gut your military. He tells you that peace is breaking out all over. Just like he told you you could keep your plan if you liked it. You know, you want to know what Obama's, what the truth is, see what Obama says and look at the opposite. Because that's reality. Obama has worked with pro-Soviet communists and Marxists his entire life. From Frank Marshall Davis in Hawaii to Alice Palmer and Quentin Young in Chicago. Their number one agenda was to destroy your military. Because they know if they can take out your military, their friends in Russia and China will rule this planet. 
That's always been their agenda. Because who else is going to stop them, folks? Ireland, Italy, you know, Denmark, Taiwan. There's only one country that's holding the bad guys in place. And if you go down, folks, there's no stopping them. You know, the most significant thing I believe Obama said in his entire first term of office when he was caught off mic, so he thought, in South Korea with the then Russian president, Dmitry Medvedev. Yes, Mr. Medvedev, when I get re-elected, I'll have more flexibility to deal with you. Yes, said Medvedev, I understand. I will pass your message on to Vladimir. We are with you. How much more blatant does it need to get, folks? How much more of a warning do you need? How serendipitous was that mic being off to let you know what your president really thinks? Now, I've got two books on the market. I've got a few copies of each there. The first book was Barack Obama and the Enemies Within. 700 pages almost on Obama's ties to pro-Soviet Marxists, pro-Palestinian terrorists, radicals, the whole stripe. And I'll tell you what, you see the size of that thing. 700 pages, that is heavy. And I got bloody sick of lugging that round the country, I can tell you. Okay? And I vowed and promised that my next book would be smaller and lighter. And this one is The Enemies Within, Communists, Socialists and Progressives in the US Congress. And guess what, folks? It's bigger. Because those bloody commies just kept on coming, folks. The deeper I dug, the more I found. And I couldn't leave out Debbie Stubber now, could I? Oh. Certainly couldn't ignore John Conyers. Oh. And even Gary Peters, who a lot of people don't realise is one. I couldn't leave him out. You might be surprised that Michigan's had quite a few of them, people. A lot. You know, you've got that union background here. You've got the United Auto Workers Union. They've always used that as a base to control your state. You had Coleman Young in Detroit, card-carrying member of the Communist Party. Had Irma Henderson on his council, Ken Cockrell, Marion Mahaffey, all card-carrying members of Democratic Socialists of America. They brought that city down, folks. And what they did to Detroit is a model for Obama's America. Elections have consequences. Now the books are really about the two big secrets of modern communism. The first secret I think they borrowed from the devil. Because we all know that the cleverest thing the devil ever did was to convince people he doesn't exist. And what have the communists done in the last 20 years, folks? They don't exist, right? Or if they do, they're no longer a threat, are they? Some of the Ukrainians might differ on that one now. The second big secret of modern communism, which is hardly ever discussed in all the thousands of books on the subject, it is the ability of a tiny Marxist-Leninist party, maybe only a few hundred comrades strong, to influence and even control the legislative process in their country. In other words, to write the laws. So what I'm saying is, less than 20,000 card-carrying communists in your country are writing the laws that rule the lives of more than 300 million Americans. A little bit far-fetched, isn't it? Very small tail wagging a very big dog. Now, the key to this in your country and most Western countries is control of the labour unions. And you can see this playing out in your state, folks. And you might say, well, yeah, the unions, 11, 12 percent of the workforce now, big deal. But how many elected Democrats in this country, at any level from, from county to federal, do not owe their job to the labour unions? For, you know, for get out the vote, for money, for manpower, even for vote fraud. They rely on the unions, folks. And if the unions give you a job and they can take it away and they tell you to do a certain thing, what are you going to do? They have the power, folks. So the process is very simple. <clears throat> in 
Well, you were, go again. You were very lucky in this country for a long time because your AFL CIO was run by hardcore anti communists like Lane Kirkland and George Meany. And they kept the Reds out of the unions. But in 1995, there was a coup. That was the year that Democratic Socialists of America, your largest Marxist group, very strong in this state, a whole bunch of their sympathisers in your legislature, very strong. That was the year they took over the AFL-CIO. They kicked out Lane Kirkland and put their member John Sweeney in as president. He removed the anti-communist clause from the AFL-CIO's constitution and the Marxists came flooding back. And now their protege Richard Trumka is running it for them. What this did was effectively give them control of the Democratic Party because they can determine who gets elected and who doesn't. They mounted a purge. They got rid of as many centrists and moderate Democrats as they could. The last one to fall was Joe Lieberman from Connecticut. And now they control that party lock, stock and barrel, folks. And all these poor Democrats out there, good loyal Americans, most of them, still think they're voting for Harry Truman and JFK neither of whom would even get in today's, today's Democratic Party. Both of them would probably be in the Tea Party, to be honest. So the process is simple. The Marxist set a policy. It might be socialisation of student loans or green jobs or normalisation of relations with Cuba. They set a policy. This is what we want. They then make it union policy because they control the unions and the unions then make it Democrat policy. There's hardly a policy in today's Democratic Party that cannot be traced directly back to the Communist Party USA or Democratic Socialists of America or both. They run it, folks. They are running the Democrats' agenda right now, which is why you have a centre-right electorate and way left government because the unions and the communists are setting the agenda. Now, I'm going to give a couple of examples how this works in practice. Now, you know, I've got a few corny jokes in my thing, and I know some people have heard them before, but I can't resist saying them all over again. You know, I love them. <laughs> but the first example I'm going to give, if you've been following the news very, very closely, you may have heard of it. It's called Obamacare. That's a joke. Good to see you keeping up. Okay. Now look, I acknowledge that Obamacare is not yet fully socialised or single payer, as in the government pays all the bills, health care, but we all know where it's going. Harry Reid said so. Nancy Pol uh, Na um, Jan Schakowsky said so. This is going to single payer, folks. This is just transitional. And I come from a country that's had state-run health care my entire life. I've known nothing else, folks. And I'll tell you what, it sucks. <laughs> Everything you've ever heard about it is true and worse. But I still get, thank you, I still get people say to me, well, even Republicans, I say, well, it's not really socialism and We've got to think of the, un the uninsured and the pre-existing conditions. and It's what they do in Europe and the world, you know, that, that hasn't brought them down yet. You know, so, you know, maybe it'll be okay. These people are delusional, folks. They have no idea of the implications of this. But it isn't hard to figure out. Just two minutes of thought should let you know. And this is how I look at it. If you're in a free market healthcare system, and I know it's not free market here, but at least it's still partially free market. You are a customer. You're a customer of that system. They can make money from you. And if you're a physician, your patient is your customer. And the longer your patient lives, and the happier and healthier and more productive they are, the more holidays they can afford to give you. Isn't that the way it works? You know, like how do you business folk in the room treat your customers? Like gold, don't you? Take them golfing, give them Christmas cards, you love them. They're your life's blood. But if you're in a single-payer system, 
very attractive to some people. The government's going to pay my health bills. But the problem is this. The budget will be fixed X amount. And nobody can make a profit off you. All you are, every procedure or operation you have, is a direct draw from a fixed budget. A zero-sum game. So what do you then become, folks? A liability. You are a liability on the system. And how do you business folk in the room treat your liabilities? Well, you should eliminate them, right? Business 101, eliminate your liabilities. What are the implications of that, people? Look, I get, I get in death panels, they say this. You don't need death panels, folks. It does, you don't even need it. You imagine this. Every head of every oncology department, renal department, cardiac department, and virtually every public hospital on this planet, except for here, is their own death panel. You think of it. You're the head of the oncology department at Christchurch Public Hospital, where I come from. You have a budget of, say, $50 million a year for chemotherapy to treat cancer patients. You've got a 75-year-old guy in this bed with prostate cancer. You can give him $100,000 worth of chemo and extend his life two, three, maybe five years. You've got a seven-year-old girl in this bed. She's got leukemia. You can give her $100,000 worth of chemo and extend her life 20, 30, 50 years. She may grow up, marry, have children, have a career. Your budget's running out, folks. It's the end of the financial year. The fixed budget is running out. You can only afford to treat one of them. What are you going to do? It's not hard to figure out, is it, folks? Fixed budget, unlimited needs. Fixed budget. What, what can doctors do but triage? Ration. You know, we don't talk about rationing in my country. We just know that if you're old and not paying taxes and you're a, a useless eater, you do not get the same treatment as someone who's young and productive. You just don't. It's like on the battlefield. You've got the troops who are going to die, who are wounded, the troops who can be left for a while, and the ones that if you work on now, you can save. You triage. Doctors triage all the time because it's a fixed budget, unlimited needs. What else can you do? That's how it works in Australia. That's how it works in New Zealand, Britain. Works out in Canada, which is why they all come here. But it's going to be different in America, right? Because the laws of economics don't apply here, do they? Okay. If you want to know what Obamacare is going to be like, if it's allowed to continue and it cannot be allowed to continue, just ask a veteran. Look at the Veterans Administration. Single payer health care. The government pays their bills. And what do they do to save their money? They deny treatment. Very simple. Look at the Indian reservations. They've had single payer for 100 years. Done them a lot of good, hasn't it? Would you like to send your sick child to be treated at an Indian reservation or a veterans hospital? That's what single payer is, folks. Can't work any other way. Now, the father of the single payer healthcare movement in this country is a man called Quentin Young. From Chicago, a retired physician. He's pushing 90 now. And I often wish he'd gone to live in Britain 20 years ago. So he probably wouldn't be with us now, but he is. And he's been trying to wreck your health system all his life. It's his mission. He set up physicians for a national health plan, doctors for medical rights, a whole bunch of single-payer organisations. He's worked with the AMA, Canadian doctors, and worked with congressmen like your John Conyers on several occasions to get single-payer legislation in front of your Congress but it was always voted down. But in 2009, with the Affordable Health Care Act, they finally started to make progress. And it's not surprising that the progress came under Mr Obama, 
because for many years in Chicago, Quentin Young was Mr. Obama's personal physician and friend and political mentor. He openly claims credit for indoctrinating Obama into single-payer health care, says Obama was a huge fan of socialised health care when he was an Illinois state senator and nobody paid any attention to him. Quentin Young was a 40-year veteran of the Communist Party USA. Any Vietnam veterans in the room? Thank you. I knew there would be several. Thank you very much, guys. And not... Back in 1972, Quentin Young and three other doctors travelled to North Vietnam to offer their services to Ho Chi Minh's communist government when they were trying to kill gentlemen in this room. That's how patriotic Quentin Young is. Goes to Cuba quite often, works with the Castro brothers. Real patriot. Now, he... After the Communist Party, he joined Democratic Socialists of America in the early 80s, and they are the people behind Obamacare, folks, 100% their baby. They've been pushing this for 40 years. They had people on Hillary Clinton's panels when she tried to socialise health care. They've been promoting it through Physicians for a National Health Plan, through the um, AFL-CIO, which they control, and also through the Congressional Progressive Caucus, which they set up. That's 80 members of your House of Representatives, the largest caucus in your Congress, set up by Marxists to channel their policies into your Congress. And a whole bunch of your local people are involved in that, including John Conyers and, yeah, I could list them all. Now, right now, Democratic Socialists of America is boasting in their publications that Obamacare is going to fail. It's going to fail, folks. It's such a screw-up. But that's good, because then they're going to blame the greedy doctors and the dirty insurance companies, and single-payer comes next. That is the plan. Very cynical plan. Now, to, to emphasise the point, just before the last election, the Obama campaign put out a little video designed to embarrass Mitt Romney. They said, hey, Mitt, guess what? The joke's on you. You know how you hate Obamacare, you think it sucks, you want to get rid of it. Well, one of the key architects of it, their words, that was John McDonough, former Massachusetts state legislator, Harvard academic. Well, guess what, Mitt? He was also the architect of Romney Care, and he says they're the same system. And it's true. John McDonough designed both systems. What the video didn't say is that John McDonough was the Boston chairman of Democratic Socialists of America, a Marxist. So a Marxist designed Obamacare. The same Marxist group promoted it, th promoted it through the Progressive Caucus, the AFL-CIO, and Physicians for a National Health Plan. And another member of that group, Quentin Young, personally indoctrinated your president into it. You think they might have had some influence, folks? 7,000 of them, that's all there are. And they are on the verge of wrecking the greatest healthcare system the world has ever known. And you can't let them get away with it, folks. You've still got to stop this, and you can stop it. The other big Marxist scam that's happening right now, and we're hanging on this one by a whisker at the moment, is comprehensive immigration reform, otherwise known as amnesty. Now you have Republicans who tell you they're hell-bent on passing this, and that's a very appropriate phrase, I'll tell you. And they're telling you, well, you know, the John McCains and the John Boehners and the Lindsey Grahams and the Marco Rubios and, and um, Eric Cantor's, they're telling you you've got to have amnesty, and if you get it and give these people 12, 20 million illegals citizenship and voting rights, they're going to become so grateful they'll all start ticking those R's, right? Good little Republican voters. That's just delusional. You know, the Latinos who are the bulk of the illegals vote overwhelmingly Democrat. You know, you look at the black population in this country. It's voted overwhelmingly Democrat, 90%, for 60 years now. 
no matter what the Democrats do to degrade and enslave their communities, they still keep ticking those Ds. 80% of the Jewish population in this country has voted Democrat for more than 100 years. No matter what Obama does to Israel, they still keep ticking those Ds. People don't change quickly, folks. And maybe the Latinos who are very socially conservative may change in time. But we've got two and a half years, folks, two and a half years to save this country. And I'll explain why I say that. It ain't going to happen in two and a half years, folks. Now, why do these Republicans, and I'll use Republicans in inverted commas, by the way. Why do these Republicans tell you this garbage? Could it be connected? Could it be connected in any way to the fact that the US Chamber of Commerce has spent more than $1.7 billion promoting amnesty in the last 10 years? What do you think the Chamber wants out of it, guys? Cheap labour. Cheap labour to pluck their chickens and pick their watermelons and run their hotels. Because to the Chamber of Commerce, the people who used to sell scrap metal to Japan, in case you'd forgotten, the Chamber of Commerce, before World War II, the Chamber of Commerce thinks that their profits are more important than your national, national security or your border integrity or the laws of your land. What do you think of that attitude, guys? A little bit unpatriotic, I think. But the real driver of this is the hard left. This was started in California in the 1950s by a Communist Party member named Bert Corona. He was also a Democrat. He set up the big um, Viva Kennedy clubs in the early 60s, the first organised effort to bring Latinos into the Democratic Party. He also set up a whole network of support groups for illegal immigrants across the Southwest and Southern California. And the purpose of these groups was to encourage illegals across the border to get them settled, get them working, get them citizenship and voting. That was the key. Corona also trained a whole bunch of disciples to carry on his work for him. And, one of, and three of these disciples are very active today out in California, work very closely together. The first one is Antonio Villagarosa, a hardcore Marxist and until recently the mayor of Los, An Los Angeles. He turned Los Angeles into a sanctuary city and the illegals flooded in in their hundreds of thousands, changed the entire demographics of the state. Second member of this group, Gil Cedillo, a Communist Party supporter and until recently the head of the California State Senate. Big time immigration activist. He got the DREAM Act pushed through in California a couple of years ago which gave all sorts of so-called rights to the children of undocumented workers. Third member of this group, Maria Elena Durazzo, another Marxist, the most powerful woman in California, in my opinion, the head of the California AFL-CIO, the unions. She is behind the massive union-driven and paid-for voter Latino voter registration drives and get-out-the-vote efforts that have added hundreds of thousands of Latino voters to the California rolls in the last 15 years, almost all of them Democrats. Because of their work, and this was a deliberate program, California, which was once a reddish, purplish state, is now solidly blue. Even Orange County, once the most conservative county in the entire United States, is now purple because of this deliberate program. And I'll tell you what, well, I'll go into this in a minute. You go out to Arizona now. A politician died there in 2012, the most successful one from that state for some time, in my opinion, and I bet you've never heard of him. His name was Lorenzo Torres. He was the head of the Communist Party USA's Latino Commission. And I discovered a letter in, a letter in um, Denver a few weeks ago from, a, from an American communist on behalf of the Soviet consulate in San Francisco talking to Torres and Corona and Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta 
who Obama gave the Medal of Freedom to last year, about how they were to choose young Chicanos to train at the Patrice Lumumba School in Moscow to train them up on Chicano nationalism. The Soviets were manipulating these people, folks. Therese was doing the same as Corona, setting up immigrants' rights support groups all through the southwest, from Texas to Colorado, Nevada, Nevada to New Mexico. He was also organising opposition to any attempt to crack down on illegal immigration. He led the big rallies against SB 1070 in Arizona a couple of years ago, which thanks to people like you, they lost. They lost that battle. He also set up networks in Phoenix and Tucson, which gave your Arizona's congressional delegation, Arizona, one of the reddest states in the union, he gave them three Communist Party supporters in your Congress. Raul Grahalva, Ed Pastor and the freshman Kirsten Cinema, all profiled in my book. But the man who is driving this today, right now, is a man called Alisao Medina. You would have seen him on TV, I guarantee it, wearing a purple shirt, leading an immigration rally. He is the man driving the movement full time now. He is the man who got the bill pushed through your Senate and he's been using his union members across this country to pressure your Republican congressman to flip their vote to get the bill passed through the House. Hard at it, people. He's a card-carrying member of Democratic Socialists of America. He's a supporter of the Communist Party USA, a former member of Obama's Latino Advisory Committee, and Obama personally consulted him before embarking on this latest immigration push. He works very closely with Louis, uh, Raul Grahalva on immigration issues and also with Luis Gutierrez, the rep from Illinois, who is driving this through the House. Gutierrez is a former member of the Puerto Rican Socialist Party, a pro-Cuban Marxist-Leninist outfit, allied to terrorists. Now, see what people think of this one. Which organisation in this country 20 years ago was leading the charge to, to, to keep illegal immigrants out of the country, against illegal immigration? Well, he was part of it, but it was the AFL-CIO. It was the unions, folks. Because <coughs> they saw that illegal immigrants were unfair competition for union members would drive wages and conditions down. So in 2014, which organisation is leading the charge to legalise illegal immigrants? The unions, AFL-CIO and SEIU. So why were illegal immigrants bad for union workers 20 years ago and good for them now? The fact is they aren't. The difference is this. Before 1995, the unions were there to represent the interests of their members. After 1995, when they were taken over by Democratic Socialists of America and the Communist Party USA, they became there to promote socialist revolution. Illegals are real bad for union workers, folks, but they're great for socialist revolution. The unions are deliberately selling out their own membership because the revolution comes first. Our more union members need to wake up to this one. It took Medina, and they resisted this, folks. They saw this was bad. <clears throat> it took Medina five years of hardcore lobbying within the AFL-CIO to get them to flip their policy from anti-illegal immigrant to pro-illegal immigrant back at their convention in Louisiana in 2000. The Marxists did it, folks. The Marxists conned them into it. So why do, does he want it? What is the big deal? Why is this his life's work? Well, Medina let the cat out of the bag, or the rat out of the bag, perhaps, at a big progressive conference in Washington, D.C. three years ago. I've got him on tape, quote him in my book. He got up in front of the comrades and said this, the number one priority of the progressive movement is an immigration bill. We've got to get citizenship and voting rights for our 11 million undocumented workers. Notice how they all keep, always keep the figure low. 
And did he talk about compassion or reuniting families or giving immigrants a break or the American dream? Not a single word, folks. All he said was this. In 2008, Latinos voted overwhelmingly for Obama and progressive candidates. If we stand by these people and get them citizenship and voting rights, they will stand by our movement. That will give us at least 8 million more Democratic Party votes. That will give us a governing majority, not just for the next few election cycles, but for the foreseeable future. In other words, forever, folks. 8 million votes. The last election was decided by 2 million. 8 million more Democratic Party votes. They get those people, Texas will go blue. And you take the electoral college votes from Texas, your second most populous state, and the Democrats are pouring in there now, add them to the electoral college votes of California, your most populous state, which they've already got through immigration, add the totals together, the Republicans can never elect another president. Can't happen. It's gone, folks. One party state. And if you think that Democrats are arrogant now, what would they be like with 8 million more votes in their pockets and the Republicans permanently out of office? It wouldn't be just the IRS they send after you, folks. This won't be like France or Germany, people. It'd be like Venezuela very quickly and Cuba not too long after, because that is the plan. And you have Republicans, folks, who tell you this is good for the GOP. They're not stupid. They can add up figures. They know what elections are about. They know the consequences of what they're doing. They are selling out their own party, folks, lining their own pockets at your expense and your country's expense. And you've got to primary them out, folks. The only reason that bill didn't go through the House this session is uh, so terrified of what happened to Marco Rubio when he flipped on immigration and what you guys are about to do to Lindsey Graham in South Carolina. That's all that's kept them under control. Now, the book is also about the individuals because I think these people should be held accountable for what they are doing to your country. Now, Anybody in this room, not counting military, who's ever applied for a federal government job who is willing to admit it? <laughs> Must be at least one, surely. Yes, sir. Okay. Good on you, Mike. Good on you, John. Okay, another brave man. Look, there's a lot of good federal government jobs. There'd be at least six. <laughs> at least, you know. But did you guys need an FBI security clearance to get your positions? Now, depending on the level of your job, I know they can go through your underwear drawers, right? They check out your family background, um, friends you might have had, um, overseas travel, education, drug habits, any dodgy uncles. I, look, a friend of mine applied for a federal government job two years ago. Wasn't even that high. The FBI drove to Canada and interviewed his communist uncle. On the strength of that, he was denied that position. They take it seriously, folks, and so they should. You are applying for a job at the heart of the free world. You might have the ability to influence public policy someday. You might be guarding the president someday, have access to state secrets. They need to be able to trust you. And fair enough. You've got a lot of enemies, folks. But what if you're a young communist radical like John, John Conyers? or Danny Davis, or Barbara Lee, or Eddie Bernice Johnson, or Rosa DeLauro, go on and on, who hangs around with the Communist Party, they control the local unions in the Democratic Party, and they can elect you to Congress, or the Senate. And you there you can serve on the Homeland Security Committee, or the Science and Technology Committee, or the Armed Services Committee, or even the Intelligence Committee. And you can have access to all sorts of very important government secrets and the ability to influence public policy, not just on a national level, but an international level. 
How much of an FBI security clearance do you need for that one, guys? Zero. Because the people are supposed to vet the candidates, right? And the media is supposed to help you do it, right? How's that working out for you guys? Look, they did it with Sarah Palin and Mitt Romney. We knew all about Sarah Palin's kids' Facebook pages. You had a right to know about that, right? Because she might be leading your country one day. We had a right to know about Mitt Romney allegedly beating up some young gay kid when he was 17. We know everything about Mitt Romney, everything about Sarah Palin, but we know nothing, the voting public knows nothing about the elephant's graveyard of skeletons in Obama's closet, or John Conyers, or Barbara Boxes, or Nancy Pelosi's. That's different, isn't it? We don't need to know about them because then we might not vote for them. So there's a double standard there. Look, think about it. If you were a North Korean intelligence officer or a Cuban or a Venezuelan or a Russian or a Chinese or an Iranian sitting up the United Nations in New York with networks through the unions and the communist parties of this country who had the ability to elect their sympathisers to your Congress and get almost any information they want and the ability to influence public policy in their direction, do you think they'll be stupid enough not to take advantage of that? This massive hole in your national security, no security checks, they can get any radical nutcase Marxist in there they like. They put Hanson Clark in there. Hanson Clark hangs around with the Workers' World Party. He's out now. Gary Peters took his seat, I think. Hanged around with the Workers' World Party, a pro-North Korean and Iranian outfit, and they put him into Congress. Nobody said boo to that. Do you think the enemies of your country don't take advantage of that? Think of the Vietnam War, folks. Did you guys lose that war in the jungles? You won every battle. You had it locked down. But you were not allowed to win the war, folks. You weren't allowed to bomb Hanoi Harbour. You weren't allowed to advance, chase in hot pursuit. There was all sorts of crazy rules of engagement that were holding you back. And who put those on you, folks? Who defunded the Vietnamese government after the war, after you guys withdrew and allowed the North Vietnamese communists to take over? Democrats and your Congress. Many of them, like John Conyers, were allied to the Communist Party USA, which was subservient to the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, which was allied to the Communist Party of North Vietnam. You think there could have been a little bit of collusion there, folks? What do you call it when people in your government deliberately help your enemies and betray your troops in the field? Serious offence, isn't it? And how many of them ever faced a single penalty for it? John Conyers is still in Congress now, thanks to that stupid judge. One of them is now Secretary of State, folks. So this has been going on for a while. You know, you've got members of the Congressional Black Co Congregation who go down to Cuba on a regular basis, Congressional Black, Black Caucus, to confer with... Raul Castro about how they're going to change policies in your Congress to ease trade and travel restrictions on communist Cuba. So basically they can send more spies and terrorists to your country and scam more money out of you. What do you call it when someone goes from your country to an enemy foreign country to work against you? <laughs> Obama, yeah. But it's happening every day, folks. It's happening every day and nobody says boo. You know, John Conyers, the head of the Judiciary Committee for years, the, the body that writes your laws, 50 years with the Communist Party, 40 years with Democratic Socialists of America. I've got photos in my book attending D Democratic Socialists of America conferences in this city last year, 2013. You've got Charlie Rangel, on the Ways and Means Committee, the body that writes your tax laws, 50 years with the Communist Party, involved in at least two Soviet fronts and 
big buddies with Fidel Castro. You've got Rosa DeLauro from Connecticut, one of your very top Democrats, has a headquarters, has an office in the headquarters of the Connecticut Communist Party. I've got pictures in my book of her hugging Joel Fishman, the head of the Connecticut Communist Party, the daughter-in-law of a known Soviet spy and the communist delegated with liaising with the Democratic Party. You know, Barbara Lee, 40 years with the Communist Party. Raul Grijalva, pretty much the same. Eddie Bernice Johnson, at least 20 years. Patty Murray out of Washington State, way long history with the Communist Party. Tammy Baldwin, the freshman senator from Wisconsin. A former member, no, still a member, I believe, of a support network for the Marxist-Leninist Colombian narco-terrorists has used her position in your Congress and your Senate to try and get US military aid cut off to the Colombian government who's fighting those terrorists. Right now, doing it right now. You got Danny Davis and Jan Schakowsky and Jerry Nadler, all card-carrying members of Democratic Socialists of America while in your Congress. And Judy Chu out of California. Looks like butter wouldn't melt in her mouth Lovely looking Chinese lady, beautiful haircut, nice clothes, softly spoken. Head of the Progressive Caucus, head of the Asia Pacific Caucus in your Congress, very powerful body. Goes to Ch on Obama's re-election committee, goes to China on a regular basis to build business ties between China and California. When she's there, she says to the Chinese press, I'm coming home. The Chinese press has described her as China's representative in your Congress. Go back to Greensboro, North Carolina, 1979. The Communist Workers' Party, a hardcore, nutcase, fanatical, Maoist pro-Chinese group, got in a street gun battle with machine guns against the KKK in broad daylight in Greensboro, North Carolina. Five people died. Many were injured. Google it, the Greensboro Massacre. Pretty extreme group, I would have thought. Judy Chu used to head one of their major front groups. She's one of the top people. She still works with at least five former leaders of the Communist Workers' Party, including Jean Kwan, the mayor of Oakland, right now, right today. One of them helped her to set up the Asia Pacific Caucus in your Congress. At least 100 members of your House of Representatives and 20 of your Senators who wouldn't get a security clearance to clean the toilets at any military base in your country. And neither would your President. Think that could be a little bit of an issue, folks? You think your enemies wouldn't use that against you? Do you think the Russians would tolerate 100 pro-Americans in their Duma? You think they'd be that stupid? But I don't want to bring you folks down with any of that or depress you in any way. Am I a little bit late? Sorry about that. Look, no razor blades in here, okay? Look, this is how I see it, folks. If I thought there was no hope for America, I'd be back in my beautiful New Zealand right now, building bunkers and stocking up on baked beans. Okay? I'm not mocking prepping, believe me. But this is how I think it is. Back in 2008, the left thought they had a slam dunk. They had the House, they had the Senate, and they had their man in the White House, and their agenda was all written out and ready to rock and roll, folks. And they were going to take down the great Satan once and for all. All those 60s radicals like Bill Ayers and Bernadine Dorn who've been burrowing through the Democratic Party, through the unions, through the media, through the universities, finally all their ducks were in a row. And they were going to take you down, folks. They were going to have their revolution before they died. But in 2009 and 2010, something miraculous happened. Now, I don't use that word lightly. Shouldn't be hard for you guys to figure out what I'm talking about. You guys, you go. where were you? You know? You know, you, you all stood up out of nowhere. A bunch of amateurs and novices came out of left field, 
or maybe right field perhaps. <laughs> but you, you took him by surprise, folks. You took me by surprise. You know, where, where had you been? You just came out of nowhere and you're thousands and hundreds of thousands and you blogged and you marched and you emailed and you rallied and you agitated and you phone banked and you put some spine into that GOP and you guys, you and Glenn Beck, took back the house in 2010, folks. Look, people, it would not have happened without you. It wouldn't have happened. And I'll tell you what, that brought the agenda of the left to a grinding, screeching halt. They had it in the bag, folks. They were breaking out the vodka, and all they had to worry about was John Boehner. That would have terrified them, wouldn't it? And you guys snuck up on them, a bunch of amateurs and novices snuck up on them out of nowhere and took their toys away. And some of you wonder why they hate you. <laughs> You're genuinely surprised at being called dirty names. Why do they hate us? Because they had it in the bag, 40 years of work, and you took it off them. That's why they hate you. <laughs> Look, people, you saved your country. You might not see it in those times. You're in the battle, and when you're in the fight, you don't see the big picture. But I'm from outside. There are millions of people around this world who understand what you did. Because had you not taken back the house, the entire agenda of the left would be in now. Those 8, 12 million illegals would be voting this year. Obamacare would be locked in. Card check, cap and trade, green jobs. The whole kit and caboodle, folks, every element would be in now. And how would you fight against that, people? Where would you be then? Well, you could try. You could try it, but a lot of people would die. I wouldn't like to see that happen. The point is, you saved your country. And a lot of you don't even realise that. Okay? You kicked all you, so what you also did. And I'll tell you what, I'm here to say thank you, because you don't get that very often. But there's a lot of people around this planet who are very grateful for what you've done, guys. <laughs> but what you also did, maybe even more important, you kick-started, you, the 912s, Glenn Beck, kick-started the second American Revolution. I've been to 38, 39 of the 57 states, people. <laughs> See, you're awake. Okay. <laughs> Okay. And I'll tell you what, you get out of the big cities, there are millions of people now who weren't there five years ago, who actually read the Constitution, understand the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, the separation of powers, states' rights, who know why America is different. And they weren't there five years ago, people. They're there now. That's huge, people. Because you are fighting back Common Core, you're fighting back Agenda 21, you're taking over school boards, county commissions all over the country, you're taking over Republic state legislatures. Because of you, Michigan's right to work, folks, all around. You've enabled state legislatures all over this country to give the finger to the federal government. Is that important? Very important. You might see your losses, folks, but what you have achieved and the cultural change you've achieved in five years is nothing short of miraculous. I can see it from the outside, folks. You have changed this country like nobody's business. Amen. But sometimes, people, I think you're a little bit like baby Superman. You really don't understand your own strength. You don't. You know you saved your country on the immigration issue. You slowed down Obamacare. But I'll tell you what, tell you this, I went to Washington DC last year and I went to the 50th anniversary conference of the Institute for Policy Studies, the most hardcore progressives in this country. They used to work with the KGB folks, now they work with the Cubans. They're the ideas factory of the Obama administration, hardcore folks. And I paid my 75 bucks and I put on my name badge and I mingled with the Marxists. 
because I wanted to see what they were doing, people. I wanted to see their agenda, where they were heading, what they were planning. And I'll tell you what, I got bored stiff. I got so bored, people, because they spoke about one thing all the time I was there. Tea party this, tea party that, tea party this, tea party that. The tea parties took the state legislature's office. They undid all this. We've got to do it all over again because of them. How do we not see this coming? What are we going to do about it? How are we going to stop these guys? All day long, people. Nothing else. It was boring. If you don't see your own strength, folks, your enemies do. They know you are the only thing standing between them and what they want. That's why they vilify you. Why do you think they do it, folks? Now, I'm going to do something now that's normally considered very bad manners, okay? But I'm a Kiwi and I can go home, okay? <laughs> don't have to suffer the consequences. Look. You don't go to someone else's country, do you, and tell them how to run things? Okay. See, I get asked all the time. That's why I'm doing it. My only value to you is an outside observer, because you can often see your neighbour's problems better than they can see their own. We all know that. It's human nature. I see a country now in a lot of trouble. I see a movement that's had five years of hard, thankless, grinding work. A lot of burnt out people, a lot of tired people, a lot of dispirited people in some places. What do we do next? Where do we go? You know, are we, do we have a third party? Do we do this? Do we just do local issues? What do we do? Well, this is how I see it, folks. You have 100 years of progressivism to undo. Might take 20, 30 years. I don't know. But you have two huge battles coming up, folks. You've got 2014 and 2016. And if you lose those and they get their 8, 10, 12 million more Democratic Party votes out of the illegals, whatever you do after that may not count for much, people. You have to win. You have to focus on winning and making that winning worth something. Now, in the time we have left, a third party ain't going to cut it, folks. Ain't time. Maybe 20, 30 years it might be. The only force that can stop the Democrats in the time we have left is the Republican Party. Now, I'm no shield for the GOP. I've got John Boehner and you know, Eric Cantor on my dartboard, believe me. But the thing is this, they are the ones who can stop them. But the question is, what will the character of that GOP be? Because if the old guard have their way and they give you a Jeb Bush or a Chris Christie, you're done, folks. And even if you fluke a win by some miracle, you're still done because progressivism just slows down a little bit. That's all it is. But if you have a real leader, a real constitutionalist, a real conservative, maybe someone like Ted Cruz, things could be very different, folks. You will choose your leaders, not me, but he's the front runner for the conservative cause right now. Now, I'm going to go back a little bit in history because I think this is illustrative. Go back to 1976. That was the year you'd been losing your freedoms, Republican, Democrat, Republican, Democrat, for decades. And the people were pretty angry about it, but they had nowhere to go. But that year, they got an alternative. That year, a man came out of California who spoke of a shining city on the hill and peace through strength and the Constitution, and liberty, and the pride in your country. The total opposite of the Carter message, guys. And thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people just like you, rallied behind Ronald Reagan. And they pushed and pushed and pushed to get him that nomination in 1976, that GOP nomination. And what did the Republican old guard do, folks? The Rockefeller Republicans. They hated his guts. They sabotaged him. They dirty tricked him. They denigrated him. They did everything they could to stop him. Ronald Reagan was forbidden to speak in Ohio by the Ohio GOP that year, folks. Banned from their state. And they just beat him. 
They gave the nomination to Gerald Ford and Ford went up against Jimmy Carter and Carter won. And how did the Carter years work out for you guys? <laughs> Pretty good. Your second worst ever president, right? <coughs> Think about that for a minute. He was first. You are still suffering from that. You know, Panama, you know, interest rates up to here, gas queues round the corner, Panama, Iran. He made a mess, made a huge mess. But the important thing is this, the grassroots, the people just like you, did not give up. They got into that GOP, they took over those precinct positions and the township positions, moved up through the party and they got behind Reagan again in 1980. And this time they were not going to take no for an answer. This time they forced the GOP to give them their candidate. The people helped to choose the candidate. He got that nomination, went up against Carter, went up, went up against Carter again and took the country in a landslide. A landslide. The hostages were back the first day, folks. First day. The interest rates went down, the taxes went down, the economy boomed, everybody was working again. He rebuilt your military, he re rebuilt your pride in your country, and he took out the Soviets without firing a shot, folks. Any better president in the 20th century? And why did you have a Reagan revolution, guys? Because people just like you stuck it to the GOP old guard and you chose the candidate. Could there be a message for today? So right now, this country is Carter on steroids. And you need a Reagan on steroids to turn this around. Not just to go where Reagan did, to go way beyond Reagan, to actually gut the federal government and restore your constitution. But how are you going to do it, people? Because Reagan was a genius. He could unite the social conservatives, the fiscal conservatives, and the defence conservatives, the three-legged stool. That was his base. Got them together. Right now, your base is fractured. You have a million people who voted for Gary Johnson last time. You've got social conservatives, fiscal conservatives, defence conservatives. You've got Second Amendment people, Common Core people. You've got two million GOPers who stayed home last time. And you've got several million evangelical Christians who should be in your base but aren't even registered to vote. And you need every single one of them, folks, to win. Because you've got vote fraud against you, the media against you. You cannot afford to spurn any element of your base. But it's fractured. A lot of these groups don't like each other very much. Do they? to be honest. But we need them all. Everybody is needed. The one thing they have in common is they all want something. Everybody in this room has a pet issue, right? Federal Reserve, Common Core, stronger military, you know, Second Amendment, whatever it is, everybody's got something that excites them more than something else, right? It's what drew you into the movement. Fiscal responsibility, whatever it is, the Constitution. So this is what I would do if I was a man like Ted Cruz. I'd want to get that coalition together now, early, before Jeb Bush gets any money or any support. I want to rebuild that Reagan coalition. So I'd be going out to all these groups right now. The first thing I'd say to them, the first thing that's going to happen, guys, I'm going to run and run early, and I'm going to put Alan West on my VP ticket. And then, for you libertarians, I'm going to make Rand Paul my Secretary of the Treasury, and he can do what he damn well wants to the Federal Reserve and the IRS, folks. He can take them down, audit them, abolish them, do what he wants. And then you energy voters, Sarah Palin, Secretary of Energy, drill, baby, drill, drill in your backyard if you want to. $2 a gallon gas for every American family, Keystone Pipeline, 
open it up. Scott Walker, Secretary of Labor, right to work all over, folks, every state. Herman Cain, Secretary of Commerce, deregulate, deregulate, deregulate. EPA gone, OSHA gone, the whole lot. John Bolton, Secretary of State. Tell your enemies where to get off, rebuild your alliances. Ambassador to the United Nations, no one. Dr. Ben Carson, Secretary of Health and Human Services. End the welfare culture in this country. Attorney General, Mark Levin. Stick it to the vote frauders, people. And for the Christians who often don't care about politics, but they do care about the education of their children, I'd say to them, vote for me this time. We're going to get rid of Common Core. We're going to get rid of the Department of Education. We're going to protect your homeschooling rights because David Barton will be Secretary of Education. Look, you could fill the whole cabinet, folks. Fill it now. There's all the people out there who could fill that. Would you rally to a team like that? Would you get out of bed every day and can't wait to get to the phone bank and open your checkbook and door knock to get those people into power? And would it unify the base? Because everybody's getting something, right? Everybody, you might not like Sarah Palin, but you love Alan West. You might not like John Bolton, but you love Rand Paul. Everybody's getting someone to inspire them and a clear policy direction. You know what you're going to get. Because where else do we work our little butts off, folks, for a nebulous promise? We don't do it in business. We don't do it in our education. We know what we're going to get. That's why we work. If we know what we're going to get here, we will work like nothing else. And you think about it, folks, you've never had a bigger team of real constitutionalists and libertarians and conservatives than you have today. Far more than Reagan had. You've got all these millions of people out there who are just itching to save their country. You've got all these leaders out there who just can't wait to gut the federal government. You put the base with the leaders, folks, who's going to stand in your way? Imagine right now you put your eggs in one basket and they can demonise a Mitt Romney. You try demonising 20 hardcore constitutional conservatives campaigning on, uh, over this country, a bunch of rot wheelers who don't take any crap from anyone, <laughs> who are all backing each other up. You've got a team, folks. You win football with a good team, right? Why not win politics that way? Because you've done it before. You didn't just have a founding father, guys. You didn't just have George Washington. You had George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and Samuel Adams and Benjamin Franklin and James Madison. It was a team that won that first American Revolution and you need a team to win the second American Revolution. And it can be done, folks. It's been talked about. I know delegations have gone to Ted Cruz discussing this. He used two of several of my talking points at his speech at CPAC. So we'll see. So what I'm asking for you, out of you, is two and a half years at least of the hardest work you have ever done. Because you've done five people, five years of hard, thankless work. But two and a half more years is going to decide the fate of this country. And you know if you do nothing, folks, you know what's going to happen. And the world, as you say. Everything hangs in the balance here. 
Two and a half years of hard work. Victory is not assured, but there is hope. There is always hope. And I can tell you this, if you do two and a half years of the hardest work you've ever done, the very least, the very least I can promise you is the right to look your children in the eye and say, I did everything I could. What is that worth to you guys? And if you win, and you can win, you'll give, you will give your children not just the great country you inherited, but one even greater. Is that worth fighting for? Is that in you? Now I'm giving you both barrels tonight. I could stop here, but I'm going to get a little bit more. Okay? Look, this is not easy. Not easy at all. But I want some perspective here. I went up to Morristown, New Jersey last year. I went to the encampment where 10,000 of your troops spent the winter of 1780. And that was a little ice age, folks. That winter made this one look like, look like Hawaii. You know, 10,000 troops started that winter. Death, desertion and disease took 4,000 of them. They weren't paid for months. They could hardly get anything to eat. They were raiding the local farms to steal anything they could. The troops were boiling up their own boots to eat the leather. The officers were eating their pet dogs, people. But they persevered through that winter. They persevered through Valley Forge. They got chased across every state by the British, losing far more battles than they ever won, freezing and starving in the snow, eating berries and dodging British bullets for years and years and years with a constantly dwindling army. And you've got to remember, people, 3% of the population fought in the war, 10% supported the war, 40% supported the British, and the rest didn't give a damn. Does that sound familiar to you guys? Yes. So nothing's changed, folks. It's always the remnant. The remnant that makes a difference. But they persevered, a bunch of farmers and lawyers and labourers and blacksmiths and you know, fishermen took on the greatest military empire the world had ever known and they beat them. And I'll tell you one other group that was a big part of that. That was the preachers. Bible in one hand, long rifle in the other. And they persevered against all the odds and they took out the British at Yorktown in a surprise attack and turned the war. And look at the country they gave you, guys. Look at the country those patriots gave you. And you know how miraculous that victory was. Would you have bet on George Washington? Would you have put your house on George Washington? But they stood up and they knew they were doing what was right. They knew they had help, folks. And I'll tell you this, George Washington understood exactly how miraculous his victory was. And if you stand up for your country, the greatest country the world has ever seen, and do what's right, will you be forsaken? Will you be abandoned? No, you will not. But you have to stand up. So we understand, people, do you think those patriots who are freezing and starving in the snow had any idea of the amazing country they were creating? Do you think they had any idea of their role in history? We can see their role because we look back 200 years. We have perspective. We can see what they did and the chain of events they set in motion. What about your role in history, guys? How about you look forward 200 years? 200 years from now, some young kid will get up in front of a civics class in this town and he'll say to his friend something like this. Guess what, guys? I'm blown away. You know how we studied that second American Revolution in history? When all the, everybody thought the country was done, the patriots stood up against all the odds and restored the Constitution. Look at what we owe them, guys. Well, I found out something amazing. I'm blown away. I found out that my great, 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 great grandma and granddaddy, 
They were in Medevco. <laughs> How cool would that be? So I want to say to you people, thank you so much for what you're doing for America, for liberty, for my country. God bless America and God bless the Tea Party. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Yeah, yeah, take questions. Thank you. Do you have that list of people you would vote for on your website? Uh, it will be. We're, I normally have a flyer to hand well, out, but email me and I'll send it to you. Greatly appreciative of Mr. Loudon coming to speak to us today. We want, he's willing to take questions. Do you have anything other than a question? Save it for one of our Medefco meetings. But if you have a question that he can answer for you, feel free to raise your hands and we'll scan the room and we'll try to get as many questions in as possible. Go ahead, Janice. I want to repeat that dream team on the radio this weekend. Okay. Um, I've got them down. Ted Cruz, Alan West, Rand Paul, yeah. Scott Walker, Herman Cain, Sarah Palin, John Bolton, Ben Carson, Mark Levin, and David Barton. Yeah. Okay. Well, that was all I had, but you could add maybe maybe, maybe yeah. Jerry Boyk in his defence or something like that. You know, look, it's up for people to choose, but that's that's the ones I'm thinking of. You have Herman Cain Yeah, Commerce, Herman Cain. Yeah, yeah. Look, I, we I, we've got a website, and we're going to go through the whole lot, the whole lot. But that's what we've just got off the top of our heads now. That's no, but we're, we're developing a website that would do that. But just that's uh, to get people thinking about it, you know? Yep. Jeff? Yeah. Uh, I got one just under my skin here. Thanks. Look, when, when you actually believe what you say, it is not hard to do. Okay. Mike? Okay, this is two very okay. That's a very good points. Now this is how I said I'll do a bit of speculation on George Soros, right? Now you got to look at Georgie Soros. He was a little Jewish boy in Hungary in World War Two, and his the Nazis invaded, and his father got him adopted, fostered out to a Christian family to protect him from the Nazis. The father of this Christian family was a capo. He was going around confiscating Jewish property for the Nazis. Little Georgie used to tag along and said it was the best time of his life. Then the Soviets invaded and they were hanging Nazi collaborators from the lampposts, killing them, shooting them. Yet George Soros was allowed to leave Soviet-occupied Hungary, effectively a Nazi collaborator, to go out of Nazi-occupied Hungary, uh, Soviet-occupied Hungary, through Soviet-occupied Austria, through numerous checkpoints out to the west. How would you do that had you not made a deal with the authorities? How could it be done? It's not very credible, is it? He then builds himself up in business, has high-level contacts with the Russian and Chinese government in the 70s and 80s, then works and works to destroy Israel and the United States by funding the left. Who do you think, I think, Soros works for? That's what I believe. The Islamists... Okay, it's a bit like union members do not understand that communists are running their unions. Most Democrats do not know that communists run the Democrats. Most Muslims do not know that Russia runs much of the Islamic movement. They have been infiltrating the Islamic seminaries since the 1920s. They have been working with Islamic leaders all that time. Um, they set up P the PLO, they set up Hamas. The Litvinenko, the um, guy who was po the KGB man who was poisoned by thallium in, in, in London, he claimed that the number two man in Al Qaeda was trained by the KGB. He also claimed that the KGB deliberately bombed their own bombed Moscow to blame it on Islamic separatists to make it look that, like they were being attacked by the Muslims as well. I could go, you know, Eon Pachepa, 
the head of the Romanian KGB, wrote in his book Disinformation last year. He had a meeting with Andropov, the head of the Soviet KGB, in 1972. They were sending, at that point, 4,000 KGB agents into the Islamic world to stir up hatred against the United States and Israel. They are directing this, folks, and it's so tragic that a lot of American constitutions Conservatives and Christians look at Vladimir Putin, who puts a cross on occasionally and makes some anti Islamic statement. They see him as the great saviour of the West against the Islamic hordes. He's running it, folks. The biggest scam in history. Except for Obama, perhaps. Yeah. Well, how, how do you think America looks around the world now? You gave away five terrorist leaders for a possible traitor. And I'm not saying he is yet. The evidence is still there. You know, like Ronald Reagan would have sent special forces in and shot up the Taliban and pulled the guy out. He wouldn't have given up terrorists in exchange. And Obama thinks this is a big foreign policy victory, that the American public are going to be so impressed about this. You know... This shows how whacked his thinking is. This man over there. Oh. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, well, there's two, uh, two aspects to that. You've always had the people like the Council on Foreign Relations, etc., who are sort of big government progressives, who work with the Republicans, and they want world government. They want centralised control. The other factor is this. When was the World Bank set up? When was the United Nations set up? After World War II, right? Diana West has written a great book, American Betrayal. She says very correctly that during World War II, the Soviets basically ran US foreign policy and domestic policy through their network of agents in Washington and the Obama and the uh, Freudian slip there, so in the Roosevelt administration. They set up the World Bank. They set up the United Nations. Those organisations, the IMF, they were set up by communists to basically drain your treasury and send your resources all over the world. The communists who controlled your government set up these organisations to scam you and you're still paying for them. When I had a friend who trained in Moscow in 1983, he infiltrated the New Zealand Communist Party for our security services and was sent to Moscow to train at Lenin's Institute for Higher Learning. 6,000 people training there, folks. They were told there, the United Nations is our thing. We run it. It's ours. It's always been ours. It's an agent of Russian foreign policy. It still is. And you guys pay for it. On your soil. That's why you don't need an ambassador to it, and that's why you don't need it located on your soil. I need to get back to the charge part. Just a minute. Excuse us, please. There you go. Thank you. Do you have a question, sir? Do you agree with the assessment that the country is in the middle of a cold civil war? Look, I would say this country has not been more polarised since the Civil War. And I don't want to see shooting breaking out. But it's, it's, this is 5% of the country is trying to destroy it. 5% is trying to save it. And 90% in the middle are basically patriotic people who have no idea what's going on. You know? So it's a matter of you guys increasing your 5% to 7, 8, 9% and beating those guys down. Yes, it is in a cold civil war, absolutely, because the survival of your country as a free republic is at stake right now, and it's coming to the crunch. What about the Bilderberg Group and the and, uh, Fabian Society? And yeah. How, how, what part do they play in all of our politics? Well, look, the Fabian Society, their offshoot was the League of Industrial Democracy in this country, which begat the SDS, which begat the, the Weather Underground Terrorists, which begat the United Auto Workers Union. So they've always had a role. The Bilderbergers are more like the Council on Foreign Relations. Super influential people, some of them communists, some of them business people, all of them either cronyists or fascists or one-worlders, basically trying to centralise power for themselves. 
So a very malevolent organisation in my opinion. Yeah, well, thank you. <laughs> oh, there's a lot of things I haven't covered. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. On top of that, the infiltration of the churches. Yeah. This is something people don't want to look at. This has been going on for years. Yeah, In look, I, area, we have a Bishop Gumbleton. He's an Gum, out -out communist. I, I've got Gumbleton. I've got a big file on Gumbleton. He's an out-out communist. I've been fighting him for 30 years. Yeah. Look, you're right. I fought Coleman Young back in the 1970s. Yeah. I begged the man running against Coleman Young to expose his communist background. He wouldn't do it. He wouldn't do it. The Detroit newspapers absolutely blacked out the communist yeah. background of Coleman Young. And then when he died, they brought out all the facts about his communist background yeah. when he died. Yeah. But there's one thing more I'd like to say, if I may. There have been people fighting this for years. I'll go back to the 60s. You yeah, French Schwartz. Society. Yeah. And Moscow in 1961 issued an order to all of the communists in the United States to zero in on a growing anti communist movement. Yep. And they zeroed in on the John Birch Society. Absolutely. That's exactly how they did it. They smeared the John Birch Society to the point where anybody who would even dare speak out against communism, you're a bircher, you're a bircher. Yeah. Today it's not you're a bircher, you're a racist. Or In 50 years, this country went from a communist being looked upon as the greatest threat to freedom in our country to the year 2014 when the racist or the enemies of the communists are now the enemies of the American Republic. Yep. That is where it's at in this year, 2014. Look, you're absolutely right, sir. Only one more thing I want to say. Okay, one more thing. One more. <laughs> Bella Dodd. I ask everybody here to look up Bella Dodd. Yep. Teachers Bella Union. Dodd. Yep. She was a high-ranking member of the Communist Party. Left the party. I had the honor and privilege of meeting her. Okay. Communists have already so penetrated this nation's institutions. There's no, re there's no reversing it now. That's yeah. what Bella Dodd said in 1961. Yeah. Yeah. My main point is that there are people that have come before and have fought. They have fought valiantly. They've been smeared. Senator McCarthy is one of the greatest Americans who ever lived. Absolutely. Right. And I I'll just, I'll just like to address that. People have come before, and the reason we are still here is because they at least held them at bay to some degree. Had there not been a McCarthy, had there not been a Balladod, had there not been a John Birch Society, this country would have been done a long time ago. And I agree with you, sir, absolutely. You know, this is a serious situation. It's been going on for a long time. The communists deliberately infiltrated the, the, the journalism schools, the seminaries, the theological colleges and the teachers colleges way back in the 40s. So we are reaping that whirlwind. That's why we don't do what George Bush did, try and convert the Department of Education into making people conservatives. You've got to abolish it and decentralise education across this country so they can't indoctrinate our kids anymore. Yep. Well, I just want to say a couple of things. I just want to say before we wind up, now, I've, I've got a couple of guys in, um, in uh, Iowa who are working with some quite big Hollywood producers to do a film of my book. Now, we're going to do some fundraising for that soon, sort of crowdsourcing and that. I've got a 
page there. If anybody wants to help with that, just put their email address on that and we'll send the information out when it comes. But I, the, the most important thing I want to say is the only reason I am doing what I'm doing is because you guys are doing what you're doing. I would not be coming to America without the Tea Party movement. I never saw I thought it I never saw never thought I'd see this in my lifetime and I'm so gratified that I have. So it's an honor to be amongst you. History will write of you very kindly. So thank you very much. Thanks, John. Thank you, sir. Yeah, most welcome. Thank you. Thank you.